and we are live. Hi, hi, cool. How are you doing? Hi, Joy. Uh, okay, still surviving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it's taking a toll on us. So I wonder once the lockdown is lifted, what's gonna happen? Yeah. Okay. Uh, While we wait for the guests to tune in, um, mm. I think let me just do a quick intro and then I'll pass the stage to you and our speakers. Sure. So yeah. Hi all, uh, I'm Joey and I'm from the Google Developer Space Singapore team. Thank you for tuning in to our second collaboration with Data Science SG today. Uh, as you know, Google Developer Space is a platform for developers and startups from around the region to learn, connect, engage, and be inspired. We want to empower and connect the community to our people, programs, network, and technology. And I believe Ku has a great speaker today ready for the session. Yes, I do. Uh, so hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, tuning in. Um, so this one is a sort of a long awaited talk because I was thinking like uh, how to get uh, the speaker to come over to Singapore to uh, speak to our community because I, I learned a lot from him. I learned a lot from him. Uh, and uh, we were sort of on best pal, uh, best pal on uh, Facebook, uh, but we haven't met physically. Yet. That's, that's, that's the strength of uh, the internet, I guess. And then uh, since we are going to run like virtual meetups and all this, I was thinking like, hey, then I don't, I don't need him to fly over. Then I can just bring him through the internet, right, and then talk to our community uh, instead to take advantage of uh, technology and all. Uh, so I'm great. I'm very, I'm very happy to to have now a, a a speaker that is from other uh, other places to now share their expertise uh, with the community. Yeah. Yeah, very happy that you're able to do this. It sounds like a friend reunion online, <laughs> bridging yeah, the I'm, gap I'm, between countries. I'm actually still waiting to have a chance to like go and meet him physically. <laughs> <laughs> but probably now, now with the with what's happening now, I probably if I travel to Bangkok, right, I have to pay for like two weeks of hotels. Huh? I don't think I can even like stay with him in the first place. Also. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. so I think we already have some audience slowly uh joining the live stream. Mm. Okay, mm. so without further ado, cool. I think I'll pass the stage to you to introduce the speaker and let him begin his session. Okay. Yep. Okay, so hi, uh, good evening once again, uh, everyone. So uh, I'm, I'm very happy to now have a speaker uh, from uh, other countries. So let me introduce uh, Charin from uh, Bangkok. He's actually the lead data scientist with uh, Central uh, Central Retail, which is uh, Thailand's largest owner of uh, shopping malls, supermarkets, office depot, and uh, many, many more. So uh, today he's going to share a bit more on the Elastic Stack, but I think I'll just let him do his own introduction and all this, and I'll sit back and relax and uh, help oh. you all to put some of the questions uh, with him. So let, let's let's bring uh, Charing to the stage, please. <laughs> <laughs> and we will move to the backstage. Yeah. Okay, so let me... Hi, Charin. Okay. Hello. Hi, cool. Hi. Thank you very much for... And Joey, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Great. So happy Great. to have you here, you know, bri bri crossing all the borders, all the virtual borders today. Yeah. And, and so it's true, I, I never met Ku in real life. It's it's ridiculous. Uh... <laughs> I like how this our platform is your first encounter together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, we, I think we'll pass the stage to you. Let us uh share your screen and then Ku and I will head back to the backstage. All right. Okay, yeah. have a good session, Terry. So, Remember, reminder to everyone, uh, if you've got any questions, feel free to uh, post them and uh, I will then share the, those questions with Sharin when the, when the time comes. Great. Okay, so over to you, Sharin. All right. So uh, j just one question. Do, do you guys see my screen correctly with the, with the presentation? I guess you are already gone. Okay. But anyways, I think you should. Otherwise, just please tell me. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, as introduced very kindly. My name is Charin. I uh, do a. I lead a team of uh, data scientists, data engineers, and um, uh, a few tracking BI people at a company called Central. Um, today, I think I would like to talk about uh, a part of the work that I've been doing in this company. So, basically, just uh, to introduce to you what what Central Retail is is. You can think of it as as the biggest owner. Actually, this the only owners of shopping malls in Thailand. Um, it owns. <laughs> my wife's laughing there. Uh, it owns all the 
the fashion, office supplies, supermarkets, uh, electronics. But so virtually we, we have no competitor in terms of offline. But um, that, that's where things get interesting because in this day and age, you want to go online, you want to compete with like Lazada and I mean, I used to be at Lazada also and the other company that I, I shall not name, <laughs> no, Shopee. Uh, so, but basically it's when, when you're really a giant offline, you want to go online, you, you suddenly in, in a t position you, you're not familiar with at all, right? Because people have heard of Central of Robinson in Thailand, but virtually online, they're not thinking of us, right? So basically we have a few, uh, about six websites uh, based on our offline operations. And one of the most basic function when you when you talk about e-commerce is the product search, right? So um, the product search. So we're gonna talk about product search today and how to build a product search from scratch, like from really from scratch with, without any infrastructure, without any software as a service at all. So um, first I, I would like to, like like all good sci data scientists, I would like to just set expectation with the business, with you guys, um, what we're trying to achieve here, right? First we're trying, so if I, I would told to describe in a job interview, uh, what is a product search in one sentence, this will be my answer. Basically, uh, given a search term and show the product that the, us the user will most likely buy, right? So in, in the simplest form is like that, it could get more, um, interesting, it could get more complicated where when you go to another level and like, uh, I don't want to show products people will buy. I, I want to, pr to show products that user will buy and come back to buy again. That will be a little bit of a lifetime value and, op and so on and so forth. But we're at the very beginning. So we're, we're trying to really just optimize what people will buy the most, right? Now, why wide search is important? For, for those of you who work in e-commerce, it should be very straightforward. Um, this is a, the basic e-commerce funnel. So we start with um, paid or organic traffic. Uh, hopefully you have more organic traffic, otherwise you, your website is in a trouble. Um, user can land on homepage, on, on product page, organic usually land on homepage, right? And paid usually land on product page or listing page. And then, all these pages, right? They have search um, incorporated into that uh, in, into that website, right? And what's really important about search is that usually it's just ten or twenty percent of your traffic, but it's all, the, the conversion rate is often like five or ten times higher than traffic coming from any other places, right? Which is straightforward because um, it is a customer search. Um, they already know what they want and they're much easier to convert. So that's why um, I think it's, that's what we're trying to do. And uh, I think that's why it's very important. Right. So um, I, I divide the work of building a good product search on e-commerce in um, very roughly to um, these three stages. Uh, I'm just gonna look, okay, cool. Uh, these uh, three, like a pyramid. So we, we start, of course, with the full text search. That's where we match all our products with the search keywords. Um, but we're, we're doing this purely by text, right? Purely by the uh, well, full text search. And then um, the next step, once we have that, um, what do you call, a basket of SKUs that match the search term, you, you just don't want to, to show what is best in terms of text match. Because sometimes it, it doesn't, you, you don't want to get the best text match. You just want some things. Remember, we want uh, to show things that customer will buy best. So we need a re-ranking model on top of that. And these are the two topics that we're gonna, want, gonna, gonna talk about today because uh, the next topic also, it's, it's a huge topic why it's by itself. I call it the cold start logic because uh, we're in a world where, for example, uh, especially like fashion electronics, um, where products, uh, the SKU with the assortment uh, doesn't stay the same, the products comes and go. And uh, if you just use a re-ranking model, which is based on machine learning, statistics, rule base, or whatever, uh, rule base is a little bit resistant to this thing. Oh, not really, right? But um, so if you use historical data to predict 
the future performance, you will end up not showing new products at all, right? And we need uh, some kind of way to rotate these new products. So easiest way, um, Epsilon Greedy, just show 10% new products, 90% product you think are the best. And you can go crazy with uh, a little bit more advanced techniques like multi-arm bandits or using reinforcement learning. But I think that's that's a whole topic by itself. So we're going to focus on these two things. Right? So first, full text search. Um, by the way, I think uh, for this talk, I always um, I always think it's the best. Uh, I always think just just talk is talk is cheap, right? You need to 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 show people the code, right? Just to borrow some. I, I guess it was some open source guy, uh, uh, very famous thing. So you can you can get all the source code of today's talk from um, this GitHub link, which I think later we will share. Um, so. You can just clone and do together with me also. Uh, it, it also works. But I will show you a little bit of um, the code I run on Kibana, the, the notebook, notebook I, I use to test the full text, something like that. right? OK, but anyways, uh, back to the slides. Um, so when, when we talk about full text search, um, I use this platform. Uh, how do you call it? You call it a framework, right? Um, called Elasticsearch. So I think no one doesn't know Elasticsearch, right? But um, just to point out, the reason why we're we're just using Elasticsearch instead of just doing some regex, right? Because if you want to do a full text search, regex also does full text search for you, even though it just the syntax is just disgusting. But <laughs> it works. It's fast, right? Or on the other hand, you can do some basic Python library like Scikit-Learn that that allows you to do um, similarity search with uh, TF-IDF vectors, and so on and so forth. But the reason that we're, we're using Elasticsearch is because it's it's distributed, and it's distributed natively. So that's why it's fast, it's scalable, it's resilient, and it also, also allows you to do all the good things that you can do with regex or, or Python, right? And of course, it has, like I think it's by far the largest community in terms of full text search. Right, so that's why, well, enough Elasticsearch uh, PR. <laughs> um, so for those of you who who haven't done full text search before, maybe I'll, I'll touch briefly what, what, what we call the Elastic Stack or what we are using to do full text search is all about. So uh, the middle layer, of course, is Elasticsearch. Is based, you can think of it as um, like an engine that uh, performs this full text search for you. So it's kind of like a database, but it's not a database. So, but bear with me, just imagine it's a database that uh, collects um, unstructured data, which I mean, doesn't make sense <laughs> because unstructured data cannot be put in, in, in a like relational database, but basically just think of it as, as a bucket, right? And from here, we, we put the data in there using uh, the layer below called Logstash. Um, there's also an, a, another product called Beats, but I'm, I'm actually not using it a lot. Um, but you can ingest um, the data into the Elasticsearch database. You call it uh, index um, using Logstash. Right? Once you have all the data, I mean, basically, you that's all you need, basically. But um, you can just query it using um, a curl, C-U-R-L. I'm not, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Um, and then you can get to work, basically. Just, it's just a RESTful API kind of framework. But um, that, that's also it's not a very efficient way of, of doing things, right? Because if every time you, you want to run a code, you have to write a post request like this, right? It's, it's a chore, right? So that's why um, when we do Elasticsearch, you, um, oops, where's my Chrome window? Um, you use something called Kibana, which is, like a console that will send you a post request to Elasticsearch like this. And you can just get results right away, which is a very convenient thing. Right. OK, cool. Um, so before we even, so what, before we want to do this, so basically we want to ingest the data into Elasticsearch, right? But in, in the context of product search, the data that you want to ingest are basically that, like, the only thing you need for a product search really is the name, the brand name, category, 
and all the subcategory, right? Um, description, some people put description into the search. I don't recommend it unless you, so I'm not against it, but um, basically putting description is, uh, if you sell a product that uh, your assortment is very diverse, like Central or Lazada, that means you sell all sorts of stuff, right? like from electronics or fashion and so on and so forth. Putting description there can really ruin your day, right? Because um, an electronics can have some keywords in the description that is about some fashion items. Uh, good example, like iPhone can have in the description, this thing is a very fashionable item or something like that. And when, when people search for fashion things, these things come up instead. So it's not very useful if your assort assortment is super broad, but um, for things like, so I, I have a friend who run a search, product search for um, this mobile phone cases company, right? And mobile phone cases company, you look at it and they're all the same. If you only take name, brand name, category, category, like seriously, there's only one category, so it's not very useful. So that's why uh, in that case, um, description was very helpful, right? But anyways, I, I think this, this thing is, is a very important exercise. Even before you go into all the elastic search, like how to configure it and all, you just need to think about what your assortment is, what your data you're, you're inputting in. And look at these, all, look at all these like uh, missing data, right? Missing data, this thing can, can be really bad because you see the, the pasteurized Mandarin orange. It has no category. So that means if people search for like, I don't know, Mandarin fruits, people cannot find this thing because it's gonna find, they're gonna find Mandarin, but like on, on the very, very bottom, uh, they will find onions. If they search for fruit, they will find onions before Mandarin oranges, which is ridiculous. So again, cannot stress this enough. If you were in e-commerce or, or anything about product search, your your content team game has to be top notch. Otherwise, well, I mean, there will always be this trouble, and and this is where you always need to communicate with them and to get this fixed, right? Otherwise, you can do the best full text search in the world. You can do um, the best model in the world. It's not gonna matter. Right. Okay, cool. Once we do all this exercise, we move on to ah uh, yeah. So this is actually one example I wanted to show about why content curation is super important. You look at this. When, when users search for massage chairs, this is a real example. You do it on production, it's still like this, which I'm not super proud of, but <laughs> sometimes that's how life is. Um, you search for massage chairs on Central, you get all these strange massage stuff, right? That doesn't look like chairs at all, right? But the reason that these things show up not is not because my search is it's screw, screwed up. It, it maybe is a little bit, but also because um, all these things are all in the category, or uh, in the category called massage chairs, which I mean, okay, makes sense in terms if you are the content team and you don't want to create another category called like I don't know massage random stuff, and then you just oh there's a massage chair. I have massage random stuff. Just put it in there. No, your 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 full text search is 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 messed up, guys. Right, so that's why it's very important, okay? Um, so, but then let's say you, you deal with all the content curation stuff, you have the best data that you want to ingest, you already ingested, now what, right? So before we go on, I, I, I like to, to have some vocabulary for those who haven't worked with Elasticsearch, but I mean, trust me, it's, it's not, it's super straightforward. I think I need to commend Elasticsearch is one of the most straightforward, the best documentation framework that I've worked with. So I've started working with it like about two, three months ago. And I just literally just read through the documentations, right? So, but basically the things are like this. Um, so one document in this case is one product. So the document has several fields like the SKU number, the name of the thing, apotoxin, category is a drug, uh, Jean Valjean, category is a prisoner, and so on and so forth, right? Um, and you put all these documents, it's it's in JSON format, and you put it in what, what we call index in Elasticsearch. So this index thing, um, so the, uh, there's a lot of good things going on in there, but we're just gonna skip all those and we just 
going to understand it as um, a database that is a database containing a lot of JSON that is magically distributed for us, right? So in order to construct this index, we have to, to set something called settings and mappings. And once we create this index, we want to use what we call queries to get the data from this thing, right? So it's, it's a, a normal REST API call, and then it will return the JSON, which is all these documents, right? Super straightforward, right? Now, the not so straightforward part is that first, when, when, we, when you create the index, you, you have to have the settings. The settings mainly means what we call the analyzer. The analyzer is how, how you process the text, right? So um, this for you English speaking people, might not be super complicated. It, it's a little bit complicated, but uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a hassle. Um, but basically, there are three steps. So this is basically the three steps that you do whenever you do all the NLP stuff, whether you're training, like, I don't know, from very simple uh, linear SVC, or you're training BERT, or you're training uh, GLPT2, whatever. You're going to go through all these steps, same as Elasticsearch, right? So first, the character filters, you, you're going to do like filtering um, what's, what we call the ASCII folding. Like, uh, you know, French people, they have this weird characters. We're going to change it to normal characters and so on. And then once we do it by character level, we move on to tokenize the stuff, right? So this thing, this thing it, it's, it's very straightforward and it's stupid to talk about it in, in English because you just when you tokenize, you're just talking about like tokenize by space. So just use the space as the word boundary, right? And then after that, we do uh, uh, the, the pause process. But um, after the tokenization, we just uh, process it by tokens also. So um, what does it look like? So why, why do I say that uh, the tokenizer is it, very easy and straightforward in English and not so much for Thai? I think um, it's worthy to, to take a note why, why my language is a little bit messed up. Uh, uh, it, it's very messed up. So it, for those of you who have never seen Thai, right? So what should I show you? I show you my our news agency, right? The, our, our news website. So if you go to a Thai news website and you click on, I don't know, you click on one random article, which is, so our language looks like this, right? So basically, you already you notice like there's not many spaces and like if it's a word, then this word is super huge. Why is it that big? So the reason is that we don't have sentence, we don't have word boundaries, we don't use space, we don't use anything. Don't ask me, my ancestor did it, right? <laughs> but then then we we have to find a way to deal with this. Um, so Elasticsearch also has some some kind of tokenizer that we can use. So the standard tokenizer basically just doesn't cut Thai word at all. Um, um, basically, I can show you in Kibana. Uh, so this is the cutting Thai words using a Thai, uh, the standard tokenizer like this. So when you when you do it in, in Kibana, it's very easy. You just post the analyze, what tokenizer you want to use, the character filter that I mentioned before, what uh, filter you want to use. So this is the text that we want to cut. Um, in English, it translates to, it doesn't cut anything. Sorry, right. you want to zoom in a bit? Yeah. Ah, yeah, I want to zoom in, sorry. Yeah. So it looks like this, right, guys? I'm sorry for if I get a little bit emotional. I, I feel like uh, I really want to punch my ancestor in the face every time I introduce my weird language. <laughs> no, but uh, it's very interesting. Um, so look at this. It's a standard tokenizer. The text is like this. So it's a few words. And then Elasticsearch just say, well, this is some Southeast Asia language, but I don't know how to tokenize it. Right. So um, another tokenizer is called the Thai tokenizer, which is a very old tokenizer that I don't know where Elasticsearch put it. Um, but it does a little bit better. It actually cuts things into it actually cut things into chunk. But the problem is, right? So this these are two words. This word is a black clip, right? Exactly like this. It's actually supposed to be like black and clip. 
But instead of 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 doing it black and clip, it does a clip and then black. So this thing obviously doesn't work either, right? Now, what actually works a little bit better and and is out of the box is called the ICU tokenizer. The ICU tokenizer is is from IBM. It actually cuts the words properly. Like so, this is um, this word is uh, ear phone. Earphone, you call it, you call them earphone, right? Yeah, earphone. So it cuts to ear and phone, which is, I think it, it works. But think about this in in um, in an e-commerce website, right? Earring and earphone. So what happens when you use uh, the ICU tokenizer is that earring and earphone will be ear and ring and ear and phone. And then when you search for earphones, you'll get earrings. So we don't want that either, right? So you, now you see my predicament. Now you see why I'm fighting my own language, right? So um, now, so that's why what we did is that actually uh, one of the team uh, has found um, an open source, an open source um, library that is in Java. So because Elasticsearch is, is uh, implemented in Java, and then write our own dictionary-based tokenizer. So basically, it's called it, for now. It's called CTO tokenizer, and when it does, when it tokenizes earphone, it will, it will become one word, right? So we don't have the problem of earphone earrings anymore, right? And trust me, this this problem is worse than you think. Like search for shoes, you get cushions. Search for cushion, you get for shoes. So it's ridiculous, right? So well, by building our own tokenizer, which I think we will um, open source because we need to open source. We're using an open source library, which has a license that you need to open source when you adapt. Um, very soon, I think uh, about next month. And if you guys are interested in using Elasticsearch in time, maybe you can try to use it as a plugin also. Right. So basically, that's that's about the tokenizer and about, I think it's it's fun to maybe introduce to you guys, because probably you, you never had this problem before in your life, and probably you never will unless you work with like some strange language like mine, right? Um, yeah, but basically, um, this, so uh, forget about the type a tokenizer for a moment, but let's say, in terms of settings, if you don't know anything about Elasticsearch at all, and this is like your first time doing product search, I already have, I already went through the documentation and here I present you what I think is the best getting started, right? Um, you know, HTML strip, like basic basic HTML stuff, connector, like when you, you want to, like a hyphen to remove a hyphen or something like that. Numerical delimiter, like PM 2.5, you want to put a space in between there. Um, and then the, the character, uh, this is the character filter. And then after that, the uh, to, uh, the, the token filter, we lower casing it, ASCII folding, like I, I uh, already talked about, like a French people having this weird uh, accent, also German people also, I guess. Um, decimal digits is, is actually one of the worst thing in Thai language is that we have our own numerals, right? So that's why we, you need to change the Thai numerals to, to English numerals. And also these two uh, snowball stemming, if for those of you who work in NLP, you might have worked with it. Uh, and also the synonyms, right? Um, so this other thing usually you solve is basically, if you do this, you solve the misspelling, the missing characters and so on. And it's, for me, it's it just, it just works and it's just a good base to begin with. Why am I introducing this? Because I, when I start working with Elasticsearch that I, I look everywhere and all the documentations, all the best practice, no, no one really have this like boilerplate for you to start out. So I think it would be great to share. So you don't have to like Google as much as I did. Right, so um, once we have this, basically, if you remember correctly, we we want we we have two parts, right? When in in terms of uh, what we want to build, so we already take care of the settings and the mappings. The mapping is basically just telling Elasticsearch which field to use which analyzers. So that's a very straightforward thing. I don't need to be telling you, just read the documentation. Um, the next thing is that once we 
pre-process, tokenize, post-process the thing correctly. How do we query? So this is this is a very actually very tricky part, and um, I think uh, this is where most of the performance comes from, right? So queries. Um, what can be so difficult about queries, right? So in one picture, I have a friend who worked uh, at Central before me. He's already left, but um, he's working on this supermarket. And one of the first problems he ran to is that people cannot search for eggs on supermarket. Think of, think about it, guys. This uh, I'm I'm telling you. I I mean, it, this sounds like a stupid thing. Like like why would people struggle on this? But it's actually the real thing, right? So this actually comes from a real website in Thailand that is on production right now. If you search for eggs, you'll get like pancakes first because there, there's the word eggs here, right? And basically, that's because they, they're using very simple uh, match query. So basically, just like Control F or using Reg X on the name. And that's why it appears like this, right? Um, if you have a little bit of of like, so that's why you you need to to how do you say um, modify the query a little bit in order to get like some okay results like we do. Uh, I think we we still have a lot of troubles on the supermarket, so I'm I'm not guaranteeing our website is the best. Um, so just to show you in real life, uh, so this is the very simple match queries. You search from for X in the field called name English. If you do this on our website also, you'll get egg noodles, right? You will get um, egg candy, which is not even eggs. If you look at the, the category, it's, it's hard candies. So um, basically what we want to do, right, is that we don't want to query only by the name. We want to use other fields in order for this to be useful. Right? Now, um, in Elasticsearch, I think for me, the best way to do e-commerce search is to use the multi-match query. Multi-match query is, well, like the name says, it used different fields. Um, uh, how it used different fields is that sometimes it used the best, the field with the highest score. So in, in terms of score in Elasticsearch, it used an algorithm to, called BM to, uh, BM25. Um, so basically that is, you can think of it as TF-IDF plus some kind of similarity score, right? Um, but it's it's a little bit, um, how you call it, dampened a little bit, uh, but you, you can look at it later. Um, the point is that it's for me it doesn't really make much sense to know the exact number because the number can range a lot from like from one to I don't know two thousand or something like that, right? Um, but basically, so this will take the best the best the field with the best match and use that score. The most field is the most interesting, not pun intended, uh, because it. It will use the average of the score. Um, well, the, we, will, we will use the weighted average of the score, and you can control that weight. Actually, weighted sum. Sorry, weighted sum of the score, and you can control that weight, which for me is, is the best thing you do. Um, some people also use cross field, which is uh, instead of just treating the fields as separate fields, you just lump everything together and just use it as one big field. Um, it has some advantages, but for me, because it doesn't, I, I just want to, I'm just a control freak and I want to be able to control the weight of each field. <laughs> so I, I prefer most field, right? So. Hey, okay, uh, Charin, Charin, hold on. Uh, I think there are some questions. Give me a yes. second. Uh. All right, sorry. Uh, I, actually, I don't see the question, but you can ask. Yeah, no worries. Uh, let me, let me, yeah, I'll, 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 once, you see, once you see me pop up, right, uh, it means that there's some question. Uh, oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, okay. We got one question. Uh, I think it's Fumei. Uh, I uh, sorry if I if I pronounce your name wrongly. I'm I'm so sorry. Uh, so Fumei. Uh, so can you leverage the tokenizer from Thai NLP for your work? Ah, yeah. Uh, th that's exactly what we we're doing, right? So uh, to attribute correctly, uh, this thing is from. It's very interesting. I can go on and on about Thai NLP, actually. <laughs> but this thing is a, um, a product from uh, the person called V. Um, I'm not sure his GitHub is, but 
I'm trying to. If someone knows, I'll, I'll post it later. Actually, ah, there. Yeah. Um, so this present week, uh, he created uh, one of the first tokenizer that goes on to become the tokenizer of the Thai Thai, Thai NLP, and um, we he also did one in Java, like incredible guys, guys. So this is what we call the word cut X. So supposedly it worked with all the ASEAN languages. So we use this framework and also. Um, so this tokenizer is, is a dictionary-based tokenizer. So that's why we use the, the dictionary from PyTai NLP. And um, we also add, obviously, a lot of central specific keywords, like you know uh, earrings, earphones, and whatever. And I think that's the secret sauce, right? Because all this open source library anyone can use, but like your list of keywords that is specific to your business, no one can take that away from you. OK. Yeah. Uh... Any okay? Is there any more questions on the ground? Uh, we'll just wait for a minute to see any more questions pop up. Then, uh, if not, then I'll get Charin to continue. Okay. So Charin, just give me a, give me if give me a minute. Let's see whether there's more question that comes up. All right. Yeah. Then I think King King Strapong was saying whether you can zoom in. Uh. Oh. Bit more yeah i think that the text is too small i'm oh, sorry sorry guys still getting used to this yeah no worries okay i think no 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 other questions okay over to you Charvin. all right thanks and um so i can show you how this multi-mesh thing works right so this time we search for x also but we use like all the fields that we can like the brand in thai brand in english we weight something more than the others like here, we weight the class, which is the, the category more, right? And when, when you look at the results, now it's it's much better. You can see like fresh eggs, okay, fresh eggs, fresh eggs, fresh eggs, fresh eggs. So everything is is, is fresh eggs right now. So uh, that's pretty nice. So you can, you can see the hot candies, the candies and the instant meal that appear earlier, like, Last time it appeared on the first one because there's egg in, in its name, right? But then when we weight the category less, uh, we weight, weight the category more. It appears also because obviously there's there's egg in it, but um, it appears much lower and it get much lower score. So let's see here it's get eleven and sixty nine. Our top one got seventy seven, right? It's not much lower, but it's lower. So, um, so this. I mean, for, for me, this already, uh, your full text search, 90%, no, maybe 70% of your full text search. But then you run into another problem of the multi-match query is that, for example, when you search for Nike shoes, it doesn't really appear shoes only. Sometimes it's the bags appears also, right? How you solve it is using the, the and operator in, in, in the multi-match, basically, um, what you do is just add operator and here. And what it does is that it forces you to have both words, right? So if I do an operator here, uh, each uh, the score that match need to match for the both of them. So what, what you can see is that once I do this, the hard candies, the hard candies disappear because the hard candies doesn't have the word fresh eggs. So this is very specific for fresh eggs, right? So th these are uh, little tricks that you want to do. But then you can see when you are this strict, it doesn't really make sense either. Because like um, when you look at Nike, right? And uh, there's Nike shoes. I mean, I want the shoes to come first. But then I don't really, I also welcome the bags, right? Because people who search for Nike shoes, maybe if they look at Nike bags, they will also buy. Then again, here. Well, that's that's why it's, it's difficult with e-commerce search. We don't want accuracy. We want like accuracy and also like allow people to buy stuff, right? So that's why uh, we combine them together. Actually, we we have a way to combine all the queries together um, that I can show you. So, but the 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 idea is like this. The idea is first we want to we have a hierarchy of matching. First, we want to match the tokens without stemming. We want to match all the tokens. Like if it's fresh eggs, it should come before eggs only. 
And then after that, we want to do fussy matching, like if you misspell also, but if you misspell, first one comes before the misspell, the second one, right? And after that, you, you also want to allow the partial match. Basically, like if it's, it's X only or it's fresh only, maybe it appears also, right? So it sounds complicated. In the query, it's a little bit complicated, but uh, it, I can show you how it looks like. Um, basically, there's, there's a way to combine all these, this thing, which is called the Boolean queries. So we have four Boolean queries. So should mean like at least one query should match. So at all these four queries, the first one is um, the most strict, and it has the, the highest score of boost. And it's an operator. And like we said, the second one is, is also very strict, but it allows fussiness. Fussiness is basically the edit distance. Like if you have a typo, you have an S, doesn't have an S, and so on. And the rest are without the and operator. I mean, I maybe I think it's it's me, we can make it more explicit and say this is an all operator also, right? And when we run the query, we also get the, we get a little bit more, right? Remember last time when we do the and operator, we get only seven, but now we get 26. But um, if you go at the bottom of the list, you will see all these uh, instant meals also, but but they are definitely at the bottom of the list, right? So, and and the score here now is it's much different. It's 171, max score here is 1000, right? So you can, can clearly separate all these hierarchy of full text search that you want. Okay, if you don't follow, I think it's fine because it's it's a lot to take in, uh, and all these queries uh, to get you started, I already put in the GitHub that you can go look at. Um, okay. Uh, share those questions with you first. So the first question is, how easy is it to take some tokenizer to be implemented in Elasticsearch framework? I, for me, I think the, the difficulty is it's not the Elasticsearch framework. It's very easy. The difficulty is that you have to implement that in Java. And uh, yeah, if you, you can do that and, and in, in a very efficient way, I think it's, it's very easy. Mm. OK, uh, another question. Uh, so how do you objectively evaluate if the configuration changes made to Elasticsearch are better or worse? Oh, I think this is this is a, a very good question that I, I think I'll cover in, in the next slides. Okay, Ken. Uh, then we, we still got one more question. Yep. Uh, okay. May we know the boosting function, how you mix accuracy and other metrics together? Is that also the next one? Yeah, I think I think I think we'll address these two questions. I think for for the first question is basically how do you evaluate full text search, right? Yeah. Um, and the next question is that how do you balance these boosting scores? Yes. Basically. Yeah. Okay. And these are like the question I ask myself every day. Right? Can. Um, okay. Basically, what we do. So first, um, easy way out for me is that you cannot for the first question. You can't really like evaluate your full text search quality. And you obviously you should not. You should not be doing that, right? Because like I said, uh, the product search has different hierarchy. And the, the importance of full text search is to serve as a base, as a base, right? So basically, if you have a good base, the important thing is that you have a when users search for keywords like, for example, chopsticks, you show enough like chopstick related items for the next model to re rank in a good way. And then you measure the, the performance online of that model. Like it could be, it could be offline performance like top K accuracy, or it could be online performance like click through rate and conversion rate, or um, average position search, um, how many times um, user, what, what user does before before or after the search and so on. You can, I think uh, we should focus, and I think we are focusing more on those like 
the metrics that are closer to the funnel instead of just like going over full text search and trying to make it perfect for me is is this one i mean you just prefer we just prefer recall over precision almost always right especially if you a company that has like huge assortment like lazada i can say people don't really care about uh, we, people don't need to care about uh, products full text search in lazada because once you search for shopstick and lazada it there is like 60 50,000 items of chopstick on Lazada. Lazada doesn't even show all of them, right? So basically, I think um, what you can do is a little bit of a rule of thumb to get recall over precision. Um, and then uh, we also trying to do this in a more systematic way in terms of have, having QA, just look at the, the search results, um, especially for our very top, top keywords. And obviously, right, when if you want to try a new query and you do this every time and like you have the QA go over like this, the QA are gonna say fuck you and like no, I'm not gonna do this. Karen, what are you talking about? So basically we have a better tool for that, right? Because you know, remember that Elasticsearch is is a REST API, right? So basically you can just use Python or whatever. I, I use Python notebook because I'm a new and uh, I'm not very good at web app building and I'm comfortable on, on, on Jupyter. Uh, so basically we can have a list of search terms like this. Um, we do have a list of search terms that I can, I can show it to you, like test cases like this, like uh, toothbrush or whatever, things that we want to test. But instead of having a, it in a, in a list like this, you put it in a, like an actual list. Right, and you can run all the, the all the API calls into Elasticsearch, which is here. Right, it's running on my, my local host right now, but uh, this run on your server, you just just change it. Um, and then after you you do it, you just use a very nice uh, library called Interact, and see like what each keywords picks up. Right. So for me, look at this, and I look at this, and I see. Okay, position one for for search term eight. Let's let's say these are your your top four search terms, right? And you look at this. Okay, X returning X. It's it's much faster. It's much more. Um, how do you say more uh, efficient for QAs to just go and look at these, and you see fresh meals. Okay, fresh meals has fresh meals also, but also sometimes you can see like, hey, why is there there the, a dessert in fresh milk is, is because the QA just name it fresh milk and, and like we still don't weight the categories enough. And you can go, you can do this like interaction with your QA for a while. Um, or even before you go to QA, you look at these notebooks and, and you just grade yourself on that and have a, a very sensible, just for me, it's there's never a perfect query, right? Somewhere, some keyword, someone is going to mess up your search. So just be careful of your top keywords and, and really just recall over precision. And the same as the second question is that no one knows what, what is a good boosting score. It really depends on, on your business, right? It's, I, I don't feel that there is, like, if there is, I would like to know, but I think it's more of an art also to balance these things. Um, I hope these answer your questions. If not, um, maybe um, we can talk later also, right? But I mean, so this is the part of full text search. And after the full text search is that, uh, these are the things that we want to talk about, the relevance and speed. You don't want to search for too many fields. And of course, obviously content team needs to care and also like, Guys, if you have a lot of assortment, maybe uh, you are you had a, a more leeway on on your full text search, but that's that's only part of the problem, right? So and and I think you guys raise a very good problem, a uh, good questions. Um, what do we do after we recall all these products? Go to part two, uh, re-ranking models. So these re-ranking models basically is. Is one of the good examples is that when people search for butter in Thai, they actually want to buy margarine sometimes because in margarine uh, in Thai we call we call it fake butter. So basically, uh, margarine has a low text match score, but we also want to show it higher because we people would tend it, tend to buy more of it when they search for for butter in Thai, 
right? So that's why we want uh, statistical models to re-rank this stuff. And this is my uh, nice uh, architecture of, of our search re-ranking models. So basically, we have a GA data. So how, how many clicks it has in the last seven days, 28 days, uh, 21 days, whatever. You just do a lo rolling window of this thing, and you have um, have some kind of time series features. Category also, maybe you do just, I mean, I, I include category level one, but actually, uh, it's it's the only thing that makes sense to include because if you you include something that has too much cardinality, like too many stuff, too many categories, then it doesn't really make sense. So I just include category level one and uh, one hot encoding. Um, these two are the things that are extracted from the product. The, the text match score obviously is to be the proxy for the elastic text match. Product embeddings here, I think it's it's something interesting to talk about is that we want we use some some results of other models to represent the product in this model also. And of course the, the full text score, right? The full uh, this is, this one actually is not the full text score, but the full text of the product itself. So here we include all the description and so on. And we just do a very simple TF IDF, right? Put it all in a model, and we either regress, we classify, or we rank them, right? Um, so time series, as I said, it's it's pretty straightforward. And I also thought it was pretty straightforward also. And just do a very random, super easy between preceding and current row, and then done. Reality is not so easy, right? So reality is that you cannot really do a sliding window that is a built-in function from anywhere because your dates, it's skippy, right? So here we have 10, 11, we don't have 12, we have 13, right? So this is because um, in products, sometimes product doesn't show up, like for especially for uh, low volume keywords. So we actually did a very like hacky thing I'm not proud of is, is that basically we just do an aggregate table on, 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 on BigQuery. The reason is that I tried to do it in Python and takes in, taking me like five hours without parallelization. So I tried to, to shift this to SQL, did it on BigQuery, it was 50 seconds. It takes a lot of money, but guys, it get things done, right? So, so basically I explained that category level two and three, I don't really like them because like they have too many values, so I just take category level one, right? So, and now, when I talk about it's interesting to use the product embeddings. So where these embeddings come from, actually? So um, th these are also the papers and, and the GitHub example that we did is that uh, there's a paper of YouTube that I really like. It was 2016 um, where they they used uh, these embeddings to. So what they did is that they're trying to predict if um, the the videos get clicked or not, right? And what they did is that they use the embeddings of the product, embeddings of the videos, right? And then just put these things together, concatenate them in together, put them through a, a few layers of nonlinearity, then boom, done, right? And then what, what's interesting is that these things, these embeddings, these embeddings, like these are video embeddings. So these embeddings represent the videos themselves. These search tokens represent the search term themselves. We can do the same thing, right? And that is, that's exactly what we did, right? Um, uh, there's another model that is a recommendation model, which takes all the name, description, brand, and category of a product and do the same thing as YouTube did, and then cap classify what category they are, right? Right. So so this this thing is is actually we do it a little bit more. We we also use the embeddings from here, but um, it those are from collaborative filtering, right? So there are two sets of embeddings of uh, two sets of product embeddings we use. One from collaborative filtering like this. Another one is from an encoder, right? So now we're not using embeddings anymore. We're just extracting embeddings, but they're actually just the the second to last layer of of an encoder, right? So we extract those encoders also. So basically, what what we're trying to show you here is that these uh, the product embeddings from here is the product embeddings of the relationship between the transactions, right? How, how my transaction, how this product's transaction correlate with this product transaction. But 
this one is actually based on the content of the product itself. So we actually have two very good um, uh, embeddings to describe like each and every one of our SKUs, right? So that, that's actually super good. Actually, maybe better than category, right? So, um, so the interesting thing about these embeddings is that also you can go look into this um, repo also, is that you can do math with it, like word to back. So uh, we have a product is a soda, we can plus it with the whiskey, and we can actually get this first one. These are beers, right? Or we can soda plus sugar, we can actually get soft drinks. Guys, this this for me is 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 mind blown and it's super cool. Right. So we 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 kind of know now. So there's no way to again like full text search, there's no way to know if your embedding is super good. Like you have some downstream metrics, but I think it's always good to do some some of these fun eyeballings, right? And you can see this these are the distribution of these um, product embeddings. Um, on the left is the, the collaborative filtering. You can see like the colors are the categories. That's why you can see like the colors are mixed together, but if you build them based on content and category, you can see like the same uh, category kind of tends to group together much better. So these these things, uh, by looking at this thing, I think it, it, it already know that these features are gonna be very good, right? And um, the text matching score, like uh, we, again, we use, Elasticsearch used BM25, but we also use, we just use edit distance because basically it runs faster and the distribution of the score is it's a little bit met, a, a little bit better, which I think is better for the model. So we prepare all the features. Now the important question is that to regress or to classify or to rank. To regress, we're gonna what 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 it means to regress is that our target is the, the click-through rate, right? If the click to rate look like this, if you're gonna do a regression, your your university professor is gonna kill you, right? It's, it's ridiculous, right? So no, that's that's our question. Um, classify maybe because you can bin these things together, and then you classify if if like it's in this bin or this bin or this bin or in, even if it's in this bin or it's in these bins, right? So maybe also yeah, I think that works also, but I think. What we did uh, is something called learning to rank, which I think makes much much more sense. Is that basically just repeatedly sample two SKUs within the within the same search term and compare them, right? So compare it like this. This is a very basic sigmoid function, but uh, instead of like a score, you use the difference of the score instead. So basically, if score i is better than score j, uh, so more than zero better than score J, the, your loss function is zero. If not, it's a linear. So the more, it, the, the worse it is, the, the, the higher the loss, right? So this is how you can, you can use just changing this loss function, just change the way you sample the stuff. You can do a very nice thing because uh, once you do this, you don't really have to worry about the distribution where you need to bin this thing, right? You can just allow uh, the negative block loss to optimize for which. So basically, here you you're telling your your model like, uh, I want this thing to come first. I want this thing to come later. And the best thing about this is that um, like GBM already have this implementation that you can use very easily. Also, I think uh, we we put it. I don't think we put it in our repo, but. Um, I mean, it's very straightforward. I think I would even say like you can just write your own PyTorch code. It would be even better, right? And now, I, I talk a lot about doing good full text search and talk a lot about doing like good ranking model. Use some like nice techniques. Um, important thing, the most important thing is that does it really uh, beat just ranking your things by past click through rate, right? Because Think about it. If our, our model is optimizing for the best click-through rate, then why the heck don't we just use the past click-through rate, right? The, the reason is that um, our hypothesis is that all the other features also have an influence because uh, it's performed better in the past doesn't mean that if we rank it higher now, it's, it's not going to perform, right? So thankfully, actually, thankfully, I really thank myself a lot of times that um, we actually have an uplift um, in terms of offline metrics, accuracy at 10. Uh, is actually 12% uplift. The position is actually position that got clicked actually um, about 23% better. So 
first of all, we're gonna definitely we're gonna get uh, better click through rate, better conversion, and also user experience is gonna get better, right? And this is the ablation studies that we did. I think um, most important, most interesting thing to point out is that uh, look at the second table. This is the new model, the, the old model also that we try other features. But the new model is that when we include the product embedding features, you, you can see that they're pretty important. But most important, of course, is, is the number of the TA number, right? But uh, they are all very important. And once you include the product embeddings, you can see that the categorical features doesn't really matter at all. What does it say about our product embedding is that they, they're so good. They, the embedding is so good that they actually already more important than just explicitly telling the model what category this thing is on. So, and that for me is, is game changing. For me, that is the reason that from now on, I won't be using any categorical variable to describe an SKU because it's much better to just use product embeddings, right? Right. So um, I actually talk a lot, and and this is kind of a way to conclude thing is that uh, there are a few things that we we want to do in the future is like. As I said, LightGBM is nice, but it's it might be better to go to PyTorch. So also we can retrain the product embeddings a little bit just to suit the search use case. And um, as I said, multi-arm bandit is very important. And uh, of course, you can see time series features is very important. We need to find a way to engineer it better. Um, also, maybe more accurate way to to imitate Elasticsearch scores. If you guys know, uh, please tell me. Um, also, these images features, right? Well, I mean, it, it's just the next logical step, right? We know that we can use text. We can turn text into embeddings. We know that we can turn products into embeddings. Why don't we turn image? Why don't we turn everything into embeddings and put it into a features? It's going to work well. Um, uh, well, um, and again, it's it's ablation studies, but I, I think it's going to work pretty well, right? So. Um, I think this this is this is everything that um, I want to cover for today. I uh, I would I think I would pause here a little bit for some questions if you have, um, and uh, maybe after that we'll go on to conclude the presentation. Okay, uh, we do have one question. Uh, how do you add how do you add user level filtering personalized search? Ah, personalized search. I, I think this is a very good question, very fair question. I think right now you cannot do it natively in Elasticsearch, right? Because I mean, you can, actually you can. There, there's a function that you can um, use the product um, attributes. And if you run a very simple linear model like logistic regression, and then you can put the weights, you, you can put your coefficients into um, Elasticsearch and use that coefficient to calculate the score for each person, right? But that that's still very limiting because then you, first you, you can only do logistic regression, you can only do some very simple linear models. Um, and second is that it's, yeah, if you want to do some more advanced model, the only way is just to, to put um, the ranking for each person the, the way that I know now is right is is that just put a very a specific like ranking for each person into the index which I think is not very feasible so for now I think um, the, the the answer the, the easy answer is that just use um, it's called elasticsearch scripts and um, use very simple linear models Okay, uh, I think one question was, just now I think you mentioned about GA, right? Uh, is GA Google Analytics or uh, yeah. do you mean something else? Sorry, uh, Jagan. Uh, DA is actually Google Analytics, yes. Okay, GA is Google Analytics. Yes, yes. Can, yes. Uh, questions, any more, any, more, any more questions from the floor? Uh, we do have one. Okay, uh, there's this uh, question. Uh, does this mean that the central search API is essentially a complex ES search API call? <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's exactly what you would call it. 
<laughs> okay. No, no, I mean, uh, um, so we, we, what we do is that we have, um, we have this full text search, which is the complex full text search. And then we want, uh, Central is not implemented yet though, to be fair. Um, we want on, on another layer, we want to put this model on top of that also, just to re-rank the result from elastic search, right? Okay, uh, a few more questions for Anna. Uh, so could you elaborate on how collaborative filtering embeddings were generated? Uh, what was the relationship model? Click, oh. click, click or click purchase. Also, uh, what okay. was, yeah, why not you uh, yeah, answer those questions first? <laughs> okay, okay. So basically it's like this, right? But instead of here is search and videos. So you can think of this as product user predicting if buy or not or view or not, right? So we 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 have mainly two models, just uh, if they they buy it or not, or if they um, view it or not, right? Um, I think it's also interesting to combine these things and see what the embeddings looks like, but we're still experimenting on that. Okay, and uh, the question, continuing with that question, right? What what was your dimension sizes? Dimension sizes, I think it was 512. I don't know okay. why I used that number, but uh, it's kind of like a convention, you know? Like, it's like half, half of a uh, Yeah, everything has to be like two to the power <laughs> of something. Okay, uh, one more question. Uh, on your last slide, uh, at customer embeddings, can you elaborate on, on that? Yeah, it def definitely. Like, like I said, right? So here in, in collaborative filtering, we have product embeddings and we also have user embeddings. But, mm. but for now, we're just using the product embeddings. And I think we can use the user embeddings also because also like the hypothetical use case is that when a guy search for shoes, I should show guys shoes. When a girl search for shoes, I should show girls shoes. Right. And and I mean, of course, this this can be done with with like a flag or something. But mm -hmm. when you capture that in an, in embeddings, it's it's much more nuanced because sometimes guys uh, doesn't really want to just buy guys shoes. Maybe he's buying for his girlfriend or, and so on. Right. So mm -hmm. I, I think you, you might be able to capture this kind of nuances a little bit better. Um, still very far along the line, to be honest, because we need to know how this plays with, with elastic search infrastructure. Hmm. Okay, uh, one more question. Uh, any suggestions on making the data science cycle more agile? Oh, um, that's that's a very difficult question. Yes. Uh, I, I, <laughs> cool, I'm in the front. No. Uh, well, well, for me, uh, I think it's, it's always helpful to, because I, I, I hear from a lot of data scientists is that they, they've been pushed into this agile framework that they need to deliver something within two weeks of a sprint. And sometimes that doesn't make sense because if I spend time research something for two weeks, then it fails, then of course I don't have anything to deliver, right? And for me, I think is, is this more like a expectation setting between your, your manager and your, your team? that, uh, okay, guys, my work is to find out if it works or not. If I know it works and I won't have to do my job. I think that's that's a big, one big misunderstanding that caused people a lot of grief. And maybe if you try to make that more explicit, it will be much easier. Yeah, I agree. I, I tried my hands before. I was like, well, assigning a story point to cleaning data. I was like, mm, how to assign when? <laughs> Even yeah, if because... I got... Yeah, because like you clean it before you do models, and then when you did the model, you found out you haven't cleaned it well. So how does that work? So, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's difficult. <laughs> yeah, that's why I, I agree with you. It's like not it's not going to be easy to like go and squeeze it into a gel, uh, yeah. uh, the sprint and everything else. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Guys, uh, yes. full disclosure, I I never thought in my life that I will be doing full text search in Elasticsearch. Just to be clear with you, All right? <laughs> like, yeah. I, I always thought I was doing statistics, going data, but sometimes like you, you need to, you need to be agile. <laughs> yeah. 
Anyway, uh, okay. Uh, are there more questions? Uh, we'll just wait for maybe a, one or two more uh, yeah. minutes. Okay, I, I see a few of your friends. <laughs> Shall we? Few of my few of my friends trying to embarrass me, or that's... Uh, don't worry. Then then I won't I won't take in any questions from your friend. Mm. <laughs> yeah. you can, can, is, is it embarrassing or no? No la, no la. Uh, Okay, uh, this one is a bit this one is a bit dangerous for me, but uh, then why not? Uh, how much how much cost will it take to add PyTorch move? Ah, you mean like to replace uh light TBM with PyTorch? Yeah, I I, I guess so, uh, based on the, the questions asked. <laughs> uh, I think it's it's very easy because right now we're not messing with Elasticsearch itself, right? We're, mm -hmm. we're sending scores of items to Elasticsearch and say and tell Elasticsearch just uh, once you get the results, just rank it in descending order. So all mm -hmm. the scores, all the complicated stuff happens outside, and then we just ingest it into the index, right? So basically, you can just the good thing about this this setup is that you can do whatever you want. Just use TensorFlow. I don't. I mean, I use TensorFlow sometimes, uh, and like PyTorch or whatever, uh, but uh, no, TensorFlow is actually very good. Uh, you, they have a universal sentence encoder, which is also very interesting to add here. Um, yeah, so you can do whatever framework you want, I think, for now. But the, the yeah. downside is that you you cannot do like personalized or something without like trying to have a good infra like infrastructure change in in Elasticsearch itself, right? Huh. Yeah, so uh, so the question is actually pointed at a uh, replacement for your uh, light BGM. Yeah. 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 Okay. I mean, uh, 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 yeah. Like, as I said, we're trying to use PyTorch because once if you use PyTorch, you can also retrain the the embeddings you get from recommendations, right? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any more questions? We we'll just wait for a few more seconds. Okay, no other questions. So let's carry on. Shall we? All right. Yeah. So so these are basically what. So I'll be honest with you guys. Not all of these things are productionized, right? And um, <clears throat> we're still in in a very like very early stages of building a good search. Um, I think a few quick lessons that I would like to close with is that here, there's always always, always, always some people who were just like, can I just use some magic stuff? Right, You, it's a daily basis thing that we will come to you and like, hey, I saw this very cool thing on the tech crunch or something. It really works, you don't have to do anything. All this elastic search that you're trying to configure, you don't have to do it, it does it for you. And I have this on a daily basis, and sometimes when we try uh, a lot, a good friend of mine on the team try to benchmark these things, you can search for very simple things like a, like a bra in a in a fashion website. You get bras. If you use Elasticsearch, you use this random search party thing. You get random stuff, right? Literally random stuff. And but but like people would just keep selling to you and i think this this is one of the issues that we as data scientists would have to deal with and it's it's not anyone's fault it's our job just to, to try to convince them okay with reasons right uh that well that's not the case right? um and also people will people can and will try and will abuse your product search i think this is very uh, important lesson to understand is that um, for a very um, early stage platform like like ours, sometimes um, business will try to be creative and and seriously, I'm not even mad at them for doing this. I'm like I'm giving props to them for their creativity. So um, this is uh, the thing where business doesn't have a good CMS system. And they they cannot build uh, the landing page that they want like right away. So what they did is that hey, wait, we have a search system. Why don't we put all the SKUs that we want to show in our landing page in this search page, and we just use this search page as a landing page. 
So this is what happens. So when we when we go into our search logs in, in Google Analytics, um, we see this weird search term and we were like, what the heck is going on? With so much traffic and like because they were doing campaigns. And then this is something that, that happens in real life, and this is something that actually I think we we all need to be aware of. and and that like I said. I never thought in my life that I would be doing a full text search with elastic search. I've never thought in my life I would see these kind of things. But I think it's what what we need to do is that this is part of our job also, and we need to to kind of own what on what we built, right? Otherwise, you can build the, the best models in the world, re rank the best mod uh, like best full text search, best re ranking models. But if you cannot handle all these things, then then why why do you exist, right? It's 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 a it's a full like ownership thing. Ah, so actually that concludes everything. And um, uh, at, at the end, I would like to just introduce my team. Basically, the guys who did the job that I uh, very proud of them. Um, so June, it's a she is a data scientist working on the full text search. Then is the tokenizer. Um, she's, he's a more data engineering, machine learning engineering. So he will be the one open sourcing the Thai tokenizers. Um, he will do the honor. Um, and then Mick is, is focused on, on the data modeling. He also has a page called Data Waste Thailand, writing some good stuff. But uh, it's entitled. If you read Thai, maybe just, just follow him a little bit. Right, And that's it for me today. Okay, uh, Charvin, uh, I, I wanted to say like a round of applause for you, but then I don't think anyone can send their applause across the <laughs> YouTube and Facebook Live. So anyway, we, we do we do have a few more questions that, that came in uh, later. So I think right. one, of that, one of them came from your friend, Alex. Uh, so how do you measure the project success financially? Ah, I think I think like, I think I touched on that briefly. If you, if you remember what, what's the goal of a product search, right? just to get people to buy. So basically, like any data science product, A-B testing, A-B testing comparing old search and new search. Uh, metrics, metric is, is a very um, business specific things that, that you want. Like for example, when I work at Lazada, um, we have a lot of metrics, like, but we focus on getting new customers. So we don't care about lifetime value at all. We're just focusing on like how the cost of customer acquisition, right? Um, this also in search also um, basic things that you want to get right click through rate average position clicks uh, conversion rates um, there's some advanced metrics like in BCG but I even me I have trouble like every time I need to explain it to to someone else so I don't think that's a very good metric to be to be measuring but I mean I think these three um, conversion rate average position clicks and uh, uh, click through rates. These these are already very good place for you to start, and you can like, hey, your customer conversion rate. It's it's very easy to talk to tell people if you can actually make conversion rate goes up one or two percent, right? It's it's very easy to show the numbers right there, uh, especially if you you work in a very large scale company like Lazada, Shopee, uh, Traveloka, or whatever, right? Maybe a little bit more difficult and. You need to show a little bit more granular numbers if you work for like smaller scale company. Like, for example, average position clicks can tell you like, okay, it's not only people buy more; people have much better experience with our search. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, one more question. Uh, how would you extend this to consider a search sequence? So previous search term may be butter, yeah. then current search term is sorted butter. Yeah, I think it's it's quite easy to do. I think it, I think that's that's one of the things Mix has been asking me to do because if you remember our oh, architecture, it's it's a very straightforward architecture to add on, and it's it was intentional. Um, I I want to I want to use all these feature extraction. It can be their own models, but the aggregation models should be very simple. You look at the GA data, it's already a time series data, and we treat it as time series, right? So well, if you want to use purchase sequence instead of just like product embeddings or something, you can you can put a, a recurrent network here or a transformers if you're like fancy like that. You you put a recurrent network here and then you output the last layers as 
as a feature of this model to aggregate. I think that's that's also something that we definitely will try in the future. Hmm. All right. Uh, any more questions? Uh, just to share with you, Charin, the the claps are coming in, and they they are saying thank you to you. <laughs> ah, thank you, thank you, thank you, guys. All right. Uh, no more questions, anyone? All right. I think that's it, ready. Oh. All right. Oh, wait, wait. Uh, one more. Uh, I'll, I'll take this. This is the last question. Um, right. can you comment? Can you comment on controlled user experiment design when you roll out a new data model slash algorithm? Whoa, I think that's that's a very difficult thing to always. Um, it's. I think for me, uh, in terms of practical point of view is that we always try our best, not necessarily always the most scientific, um, because in I think in, in e-commerce especially, it's, it's very difficult to have a fair um, comparison, even, even if you're doing an A-B test, because there's campaigns all the time. Of course, campaigns going to affect group A and group B, but Sometimes there's, there's just always some some random stuff. But for example, if, if there's a campaign for this type of product and your model A, uh, variation A, like have more of these products on top, it's going to do better, even though it's actually not not a natural way your customer would have acted. So I, I think it's, for me, it's, it's very difficult. But you try our best. Uh, you try first, it, it, it has to be an A-B test. It, it cannot be like. Uh, one week, week one versus week two test. <laughs> I mean, that's ridiculous. And also, um, I think one of the tricks I learned that has been useful is to use Bayesian A-B testing instead of frequentist A-B testing in, in terms of e-commerce because, um, you know, the one of the downside of frequentist is that um, if your sample size is, is large enough, um, you, anything will be significant right? because there's an, a small n in the denominator there, right? So, like, yeah. so it, it's a standard deviation over the square root of n. So if your n is one million, like Lazada traffic, then whatever you test is going to be significant, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe you don't want you don't want to do that. You, you if you want to use frequent tests, maybe you want to limit your number of samples, or you don't because you want to lie to people. Yeah, that works also. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. All right. So um, I think that's all the time we have for today. Um, so I, I, there are some people who are still posting questions. Also, I think given the time, right, uh, maybe your questions, you can post it onto our uh, Facebook page. Uh, we will open up, a, I think we'll open up an event album. Uh, we'll put up some photos, uh, assuming Charing can allow us to put up those photos first. Uh, and then you can post your question over there. It's because Charing is also quite uh, active on the Data Science SG uh mm -hmm. facebook page as well yeah so okay. feel free to then post your questions over there i will make sure he saw the question <laughs> okay sure just yeah. me okay so uh with that being said uh thank you very much everyone for your time spent with us uh we are planning another virtual meetup in uh june so do look out for our on our facebook page and our meetup page as well and uh thank you very much sharing for uh sharing for your sharing okay. Right. Uh, and again, same thing. I'm looking forward to meeting you physically. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We need to meet. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And also yeah. maybe invite your team as well to to speak to the yeah, uh, data yeah, science yeah. SG community. Okay. Yeah, so with that being said, thank you, Charin. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yay. Yay. <laughs>